Hey, everybody, this is Daryl Cooper, and you're listening to the Martyr Made Podcast. You're about to hear the first episode of God's Socialist, the rise and fall of People's Temple, better known as the Jonestown Cult. The story of People's Temple provides a window into the rise and radicalization and dissent and destruction of the 1960s protest and civil rights movements. And it brought that era to a shattering end when over 900 members committed mass suicide in the South American jungle in 1978. I've had many people say that this is their favorite Martyr Maid series, including many people who thought that they were not interested in the topic before they started. So if you're one of those people, maybe give it a shot and see what you think. If you enjoy this series, please consider subscribing to my Substack page where I post supplemental writings and exclusive podcast episodes available to subscribers only for just $5 a month or $50 a year. You can find it at martyrmade.substack.com. And to all of you who are already contributors, I really appreciate you guys allowing me to do this. I hope you guys enjoy this one. Here we go. I'm content to die for my beliefs. So cut off my head and make me a martyr. The people will always remember it. No. They will forget. Hell does exist. God is a thought. God is an idea. It is a place. It is somewhere. Hell does exist. But its reference is to something that transcends all things. Why we must tear ourselves apart for this small question of religion? The following article is taken from the Southern Poverty Law Center's Intelligence Report, January 2007. Los Angeles, California. Ascending the steep steps that lead from the street to the scene of her son's murder, 47-year-old Louisa Prudhomme is charged by a Doberman Pinscher. Prudhomme reaches over a gate and gives the guard dog a rough pat on the head. Sam doesn't seem to remember me, she says. What Prudhomme will never forget is that just past the snarling Doberman is the apartment on a hill where six years ago her 21-year-old son Anthony was shot in the face with a twenty-five caliber semi-automatic while lying on a futon she had purchased for him at Ikea. He died wearing a shirt that read, Keep the Peace. Anthony Prudhomme was slain by members of the Avenues, a Latino street gang. But he was not a rival gang member, or a police informant, or a drug dealer. The Avenues did not target him for the content of his character, or even the contents of his apartment. They targeted him for the color of his skin. Prudhomme was murdered, because he was black, in a neighborhood occupied by one of the many Latino street gangs in Los Angeles County. Incredibly, even though these gangs are fundamentally criminal enterprises, mainly interested in money, gang experts inside and outside the government say that they are engaged in a campaign of ethnic cleansing, racial terror that is directed solely at African Americans. The way I hear these knuckleheads tell it, they don't want their neighborhoods infested with blacks, as if it's an infestation, says respected Los Angeles gang expert Tony Raphael, who interviewed several Latino street gang leaders for an upcoming book on the Mexican Mafia, the dominant gang in Southern California. It's pure racial animosity that manifests itself in a policy of a major criminal organization. There's absolutely no motive absent the color of their skin, adds former Los Angeles County Deputy District Attorney Michael Camacho. Before he became a judge, in 2003, Camacho successfully prosecuted a Latino gang member for the random shootings of three black men in Pomona, California. A comprehensive study of hate crimes in Los Angeles County, released by the University of Hawaii in 2000, concluded that while the vast majority of hate crimes nationwide are not committed by organized groups, L.A. County is a different story. Researchers found that in areas with high concentrations or clusters of hate crimes, the perpetrators were typically members of Latino street gangs who were purposely targeting blacks. Furthermore, the study found, there is strong evidence of race bias hate crimes among gangs in which the major motive is not the territorial boundaries against other gangs, but hatred toward a group defined by racial identification, 
regardless of any gang-related territorial threat. Anthony Prudhomme presented no threat to the Avenues. Even so, he was murdered two months after he moved to Highland Park, a neighborhood in northeastern Los Angeles. He didn't have anything to steal, his mother said. He had nothing when they broke in, so to shoot him, I'm sure it was a stripe. They get stripes for killing black people. Stripes are a gang soldier's badges of honor. Latino gang members in Southern California earn them by doing the bidding of their godfathers in the Mexican Mafia, a powerful criminal syndicate based in the California state prison system that controls most Latino street gangs south of Bakersfield. According to gang experts and law enforcement agents, intense racial hatred among Mexican Mafia shot callers has led them to issue a green light on all blacks. A sort of gang life fatwa, this amounts to a standing authorization for Latino gang members to prove their mettle by terrorizing or even murdering any black sighted in a neighborhood claimed by a gang loyal to the Mexican Mafia. This attitude is pretty pervasive throughout all the Latino gangs, says Tim Brown, an L.A. County probation supervisor. Racism is just part and parcel of why they come into being and why they exist. Last fall, Four members of the Avenues were convicted of federal charges for conspiring to deprive blacks of their civil rights in Highland Park. Three of them were sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole in late November. A fourth was sentenced the following month. But the problem is far more widespread than a single gang in a single neighborhood. Random, racially motivated hate crimes have been committed across the 88 cities of Los Angeles County by Latino gang members, including the Pomona 12 in the city of Pomona, the 18th Street Gang in Southwest Los Angeles, the Tunerville Gang in Northeast Los Angeles, and the Barrio Tortilla Flats in Compton. In one typical case, three members of the Pomona 12 attacked an African-American teenager, Kareem Williams, in his front yard in 2002. When his uncle, Roy Williams, ran to help his nephew, gang member Richard Diaz told him, Niggers have no business living in Pomona. This is 12th Street territory. According to witnesses, Diaz then told another gang member, Pull the gun! Shoot the nigger! Shoot the nigger! But no shots were fired. The violence is not even limited to Los Angeles County. This November, six members of a Latino gang in Carlsbad, California, were arrested and charged with hate crimes for hurling racial slurs at a black teenager, who police said was not a gang member, while kicking and punching him. The same month, Two members of the Fresno Bulldogs, a Latino gang in Fresno, California, were convicted of attempted murder in what police described as the random hate crime shooting of a 41-year-old black man. According to police, the shooters used racial epithets and told the victim, we don't like your kind of people on our street. Anti-black violence conducted by Latino gangs in Los Angeles has been ongoing for more than a decade. A 1995 LAPD report about Latino gang activity in the Normandale Park neighborhood declared, This gang has been involved in an ongoing program to eradicate black citizens from the neighborhood. A 1996 LAPD report on gangs in East L.A. stated, Local gangs will attack any black person that comes into the city. But while the Latino gang's racial terror campaign is not new, Gang experts and law enforcement authorities say the intensity and frequency of anti-black terrorism is now escalating, as the amount of turf in Los Angeles claimed by Latino gangs continues to increase rapidly. And as more blacks leave inner-city L.A., those who remain are more vulnerable. I don't see much history left for blacks in Los Angeles, says LAPD probation officer James Lewis, who is himself black and deals specifically with Latino gang members in northeast Los Angeles, including the Avenues. It plays out not just with the gang members, but also with the way things are going for blacks throughout Los Angeles. Since 1990, the African-American population of Los Angeles has dropped by half as Latinos have moved into historically black neighborhoods. Traversing South Central L.A. today, it's obvious that the urban landscape has radically changed. The LAPD estimates that there are now 22,000 Latino gang members in the city of L.A. alone. That's not only more than the Crips and the Bloods, it's more than all black, Asian, and white gang members combined. Almost all of those Latino gang members in L.A., let alone those in other California cities, are loyal to the Mexican Mafia and have been indoctrinated with their violent racism. In Highland Park, 
Located just north of downtown and one of the oldest settled areas of Los Angeles, there have been several racially motivated green light murders committed by members of the avenues in the past seven years. Besides Anthony Prudhomme, the victims include Christopher Bowser, a black man who was bullied and sporadically assaulted for years by Avenues members, then gunned down in broad daylight at a bus stop, and Kenneth Wilson, who didn't even live in the vicinity. Wilson was simply parking his car to drop off his nephew when he crossed paths with Avenues gang members riding in a stolen van. According to testimony, one of the gang members in the van spotted Wilson and said, Hey, want to kill a nigger? The group opened fire on Wilson, killing him instantly. U.S. Attorney Deborah Wong said the victims were killed by the defendants simply because they were African Americans who chose to live in a particular neighborhood. During the trial, federal prosecutors also detailed a series of less than lethal hate crimes committed by Avenue's members in recent years to establish a pattern of racial harassment. The evidence showed that Avenue's members pistol whipped a black jogger in Highland Park, used a metal club to beat a black man who had stopped to make a call at a payphone, shot a 15-year-old black youth riding a bicycle, and drew outlines of human bodies in chalk on the driveway of a black family that had moved into a neighborhood. We were concerned about the violation of people's civil rights, U.S. Attorney's Office spokesman Tom Rozek told the intelligence report. Being shot at a bus stop just for being black, obviously that should not be taking place. Okay. The government's message may have been received, but it's not being obeyed. Shortly after the federal hate crimes trial ended this fall, Avenue's member James Drifter Campbell, 47, was charged with criminal threats for pointing a gun at a 17-year-old African-American high school student in Highland Park, the second such incident that month. Mrozek said, There are currently no plans to bring more federal hate crimes charges against other Latino gang members, though he acknowledges that similar crimes are probably still going on. Despite all the highly publicized gang activity, Highland Park is no ghetto. It's a hilly area with beautiful historic homes where the painted lady color schemes on fully restored Queen Anne Victorians compete for attention with the vibrant murals found on nearby food markets. El Alisal, the famed hand-built stone house of Charles Loomis, the first city editor of the LA Times, is tucked just off the Pasadena freeway on Avenue 43. Because Avenue 43 is one of the main roads in Highland Park, 43 is the signifier of the avenues, also known as Avenues 43. Today, about 75% of Highland Park residents are Latino. Only 2% are black. Angel Brown, an African-American, moved to Highland Park with her teenage son Christopher Bowser in 1998, in large part to escape the gangs in the Hoover Street area where he grew up. There, he caught a bullet in the leg in a drive-by, and was facing pressure from a black gang to join. He knew early on that gangbanging was something he did not want to do, said Brown. The pair was hoping to leave gang trouble behind, but soon after they relocated to Highland Park, the avenues targeted Bowser. My son had problems because he was a young black man. The avenues up there called him nigger and chased him around, Brown said. He didn't bother nobody out there. All he did was walk around with his radio, singing and rapping. They didn't want him in their territory. Testifying in the federal hate crimes trial against his former gang brethren, X Avenue's member Jesse Diaz confirmed the Latino gangbangers were infuriated by the way Bowser bopped down the street playing rap music on his boombox. He acted, Diaz testified, like it was his neighborhood. Since the trial of Anthony Prudhomme's killers, his mother Louisa has become obsessed with the Avenue's gang. She routinely drives Highland Park looking for signs of the gang, talking to anyone willing to talk. She has homicide detectives, lawyers, and parole officers on speed dial. She's made numerous visits to the site of her son's murder, as well as the spots where Bowser and Wilson were shot down. Believing the gang member who actually pulled the trigger on her son is yet to be brought to justice, she posts reward signs throughout the neighborhood, usually right next to Avenue's graffiti. Unlike the mothers of other victims like Bowser and Wilson, Louisa Prudhomme feels relatively safe on streets claimed by the Avenue's. That's because she is white. Her son Anthony was mixed race, with long, wavy hair and an auburn complexion. As he grew up, people thought that he might have been some race other than black, said his stepfather Lavelle. But you could tell by the way he dressed that he leaned more toward his African-American side. That cost him his life. 
With the Mexican Mafia's shadow looming over Los Angeles, it may be a long time before the rapidly growing number of streets claimed by Latino gang members are safe for blacks, if ever. It's not just Highland Park. It's almost anywhere in L.A. that you could find yourself in a difficult situation as a black person, says Lewis, the LAPD probation officer. All blacks are on green light no matter what. And now that's the end of the article. And if that last bit sounds like an exaggeration... Uh, I'm not quite finished. The article I just read, as I said, was written in the winter of 2006, published in January 2007, just before Christmas of that same year, 06. Too late to make it into the article. Cheryl Green, a 14-year-old black girl, was playing on her skateboard with a group of friends when two members of the 204th Street gang approached them and opened fire without saying a word. Cheryl Green was killed in broad daylight, um, a targeted, racially motivated assassination of a 14-year-old girl. Three years earlier, that same gang had killed a black man for entering a store that they said was for Hispanics only. Uh, a year after the article was written, in the winter of 2007, a series of arrests were made after authorities found the South L.A. gang Florencia 13 had been randomly killing black residents for years. The order coming down from the top of the gang to cleanse the streets of blacks and according to LA County Sheriff Lee Baca to shoot any black you see. From 2004 to 2007, there were at least 20 killings of this kind and over 80 random shootings of black people by this one South LA gang alone. At a 2008 trial related to what authorities call a neighborhood by neighborhood racial cleansing campaign, a defendant was heard on a tapped cell phone saying that he was currently prowling the streets looking for blacks to shoot. And one gang member testified that, quote, the idea was to blast at them, to go shoot them, take over block by block and get them out of our neighborhood, end quote. In some mixed race communities in Southern California, the majority of the total violent crime is Hispanic on black, Hispanic gangs on black citizens. According to an article in City Journal, in the Harbor Gateway community, quote, Latinos commit five times more violent crimes against blacks than vice versa. Countywide numbers are just as startling. Though blacks make up just 9% of L.A. County's population, they were victims of 59% of all racially motivated attacks in 2006, while Latinos committed 52% of all racially motivated attacks, end quote. From 2011 to 2014, 51 members of the Azusa 13 gang were convicted for terrorizing black residents of the L.A. metro city of Azusa, which Azusa only has 48,000 residents total. The gang leader pled guilty to conspiring to use terror to chase black people out of the city. And so the numbers today in 2019, as I write this, uh, and some of the former hot spots have begun to ebb. But when you take a closer look at why violent crime and hate crimes are down a bit today, uh, you find a pretty chilling reason. It's because in many of these places, all the blacks have been driven out. Basically, the cleansing campaigns have been successful. For example, all the way back in 1992, in a housing project in Boyle Heights, it's a neighborhood in L.A. Two black families were firebombed by a Latino gang called Big Hazard. There had been seven black families in this apartment complex at the time, but after no one was arrested for those, bom for those fire bombings, all the black families moved out, and blacks stayed out of that area for years. Until the early 2000s, one and then two and a couple more families decided to try to test the waters again, and in 2014 they were attacked again. Eight gang members met on Mother's Day of that year to plan how to, quote, get the niggers out of the neighborhood. They had been scouting the residences of black families, and they chose apartments that they knew to contain children. Each one of them had a specific job, breaking windows while others lit Molotov cocktails to throw inside. They attacked four apartments, three of which contained sleeping women and children. Months later, other black families that were still in the area, were warned that they would be firebombed as well if they didn't leave, and most of them did. African Americans are being driven out of cities up and down the West Coast, both by new immigrant majorities 
in the South and by wealthier transplants from other parts of the U.S., up in the Bay Area and other places. Other than a few early adopters, the vast majority of black communities on the West Coast, you know, in Oakland and San Francisco and L.A. and so forth, vast majority of these communities sprang up during and after the Second World War. So they haven't been here very long. They came out of the South as part of the Great Migration, looking for opportunities and hoping to avoid the violence and racial conflict that was faced by blacks who were trying to make the migration and settle in Northeast and Midwestern cities like Detroit and Chicago and Baltimore, and New York, places like that. According to a recent report, every single major city in California has seen its black population decline in recent years, except for Sacramento. Even that city is seeing outflow, but the outflow is somewhat offset by new arrivals who are coming in after being pushed out of the Bay Area by Silicon Valley's effect on the cost of living. In 1970, one in seven residents of San Francisco was black, and there was a unique cultural and political life sustained there in areas like the Fillmore. Today, the number is one in 20, with most of the city's African Americans packed into a few public housing projects. Oakland has seen the African American share of its population drop from about half to just over a quarter of the whole in just a few decades. And they're being pushed out in stages, first to inland cities in California or other Western states as the big coastal cities become inaccessible. And then finally, many are just heading back to the South is what some demographers are calling a reverse great migration. This whole situation isn't very well known outside of the local areas that are dealing with it over here. But I have a feeling that if the Latino gangbangers that I just read about in the article or the Silicon Valley gentrifiers today were wearing white hoods, I, I expect that it would be better known. In fact, I think we might call out the 82nd Airborne to deal with it. But the economic and violent eradication of California's black communities doesn't fit very well into you know, either box of our bifurcated political narratives, so it's mostly ignored. The West Coast was the last stop on the great migration of African Americans out of the South. It was the longest journey, much longer than the trip from Alabama to Chicago or Georgia to Jersey. Black people made that trip all the way out here because in many ways, life in those nearer stops was not turning out to be as promising as those who'd gone before them had hoped. Which brings me to the second story I want to read to you. This is a passage from Isabel Wilkerson's great book, The Warmth of Other Suns. Quote, By the middle of the 20th century, the receiving cities of the Great Migration strain under the weight of millions of black Southerners trying to situate themselves as tens of thousands more alighted from Pontiacs and railroad platforms each week. In the spring of 1951, a colored bus driver and former army captain named Harvey Clark and his wife Janetta faced an impossible living situation. It was a dilemma affecting just about every colored household up from the south. There was not enough housing to contain them, and the white neighborhoods bordering the Black Belt were barricading themselves, not flinching at the use of violence to keep the walls in place. As it was, Chicago was trying to discourage the migration of any more colored people from the south. In 1950, City aldermen and housing officials proposed restricting 13,000 new public housing units to people who had lived in Chicago for two years. The rule would presumably affect colored migrants and foreign immigrants alike, but it was the colored people who were having the most trouble finding housing, and most likely to seek out such an alternative. And it was they who were seen as needing to be controlled, as they had only to catch a train, rather than to cross an ocean to get here. Nothing had worked before at keeping the migrants out once the migration began, and this new plan wouldn't either, but it was a sign of the hostility facing people like Harvey Clark as white homeowners stepped up the pressure on the city to protect their neighborhoods. They don't want the Negro, who has just moved out of rural Dixie, as their neighbor, a city official told the Chicago Defender in a story that described what it called a two-year city ban on migrants. With close to half a million colored people overflowing the Black Belt by 1950, racial walls that had been defended successfully for a generation, in the words of historian Alan Speer, were facing imminent collapse, but not without a fight. 
Chicago found itself in the middle of chronic urban guerrilla warfare that rivaled the city's violent spasms at the start of the migration, when one racially motivated bombing or arson occurred every 20 days, according to historian Arnold Hirsch. Harvey Clark was from Mississippi and brought his family to Chicago in 1949 after serving in World War II. Now that they were in the big city, the couple and their two children were crammed into half of a two-room apartment. A family of five lived in the other half. Harvey Clark was paying $56 a month for the privilege, up to 50% more than tenants in white neighborhoods paid for the same amount of space. One-room tenement life did not fit them at all. The husband and wife were college-educated, well-mannered, and looked like movie stars. The father had saved up for a piano for his eight-year-old daughter with the ringlets down her back, but had no place to put it. He had high aspirations for their six-year-old son, who was bright and whose dimples could have landed him in cereal commercials. The Clarks felt they had to get out. By May of 1951, they finally found the perfect apartment. It had five rooms, was clean and modern, was closer to the bus terminal, and cost only $60 a month. That came to $4 a month more for five times more space. It was just a block over the Chicago line at 6139 West 19th Street in the working-class suburbs of Cicero. The Clarks couldn't believe their good fortune. Cicero was an all-white town on the southwest border of Chicago. It was known as the place Al Capone went to elude Chicago authorities back during Prohibition. The town was filled with first- and second-generation immigrants, Czechs, Slavs, Poles, Italians. Some had fled fascism and Stalinism, not unlike blacks fleeing oppression in the Jim Crow South, and were still getting established in the New World. They lived in frame cottages and worked the factories and slaughterhouses. They were miles from the Black Belt, isolated from it, and bent on keeping their town as it was. That the Clarks turned there at all was an indication of how closed the options were for colored families looking for clean, spacious housing they could afford. The Clarks set the move-in date for the third week of June. The moving truck arrived at 2.30 in the afternoon. White protesters met them as the couple tried to unload the truck. Get out of Cicero, the protesters told them, and don't come back. As the Clarks started to enter the building, the police stopped them at the door. The police took sides with the protesters and would not let the Clarks nor their furniture in. You should know better, the chief of police told them. Now get going. Get out of here fast. There will be no moving into that building. The Clarks, along with their rental agent, Charles Edwards, fled the scene. Don't come back in town, the chief told Edwards, or you'll get a bullet through you. The Clarks did not let that deter them, but sued and won the right to occupy the apartment. They tried to move in again on July 11th, 1951. This time, 100 Cicero housewives and grandmothers in swing coats and Mimi Eisenhower hats showed up to heckle them. The couple managed to get their furniture in, but as the day wore on, the crowds grew larger and more agitated. A man from a white supremacist group called the White Circle League handed out flyers that said, Keep Cicero White. The Clarks fled. A mob stormed the apartment and threw the family's furniture out of a third-floor window as the crowds cheered below. The neighbors burned the couple's marriage license and the children's baby pictures. They overturned the refrigerator and tore the plumbing fixtures out of the walls. They tore up the carpet. They shattered the mirrors. They bashed in the toilet bowl. They ripped out the radiators. They smashed the piano Clark had worked overtime to buy for his daughter. And when they were done, they set the whole pile of the family's belongings now strewn on the ground below on fire. In an hour, the mob destroyed what had taken nine years to acquire, wrote the historian Stephen Grant Meyer of what happened that night. The next day, a full-out riot was underway. The mob grew to 4,000 by early evening. As teenagers got out of school, husbands returned home from work, and all of them joined the housewives, who had kept a day-long vigil in protest of the Clark's arrival. They chanted, Go! 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 They hurled rocks and bricks. They looted. Then they firebombed the whole building. The bombing gutted the 20-unit building and forced even the white tenants out. The rioters overturned police cars and threw stones at the firefighters who were trying to put out the blaze. 
Illinois Governor Adlai Stevenson had to call in the National Guard. It took four hours and more than 600 guardsmen, police officers, and sheriff's deputies to beat back the mob that night and three more days for the rioting over the Clarks to subside. A total of 118 men were arrested in the riot. A Cook County grand jury failed to indict any of the rioters. Town officials did not blame the mob for the riot, but rather the people who, in their view, should never have rented the apartment to the Clarks in the first place. To make an example of such people, indictments were handed down against the rental agent, the owner of the apartment building, and others who would help the Clarks on charges of inciting a riot. Walter White, the longtime leader of the NAACP, kept close watch of the case. Referring to the first and second generation European immigrants who rioted in Cicero, he said, it is appalling to see and listen to those who were but recently the targets of hate and deprivations themselves, who, beneficiaries of American opportunity, were as virulent as any Mississippian in their willingness to deny a place to live to a member of a race which had preceded them in America by many generations. The Cicero riot attracted worldwide attention. It was front page news in Southeast Asia, made it into the Pakistan Observer, and was remarked upon in West Africa. A resident of Accra wrote to the mayor of Cicero, protesting the mob's savagery and asking for an apology to the civilized world. The broadcaster and columnist Walter Winchell wrote that the rioters, by their actions, had done as much for Stalin as if they had joined the Red Army. The 2000 census found that 50 years after Cicero sent its message to the Clarks, Less than 1% of the 85,000 residents were black. And that's the end of that passage. So the first collection of stories from Southern California uh, were from the current day. This last in Cicero is from the mid 20th century. But if you go back another generation to 100 years before the time that I'm recording this in 2019, not a terribly long time. Some of us have great-grandparents who were still alive then. You'd find yourself in a very different, radically different country. Blacks weren't being pushed out of Los Angeles or looking for a way out of the crowded tenements of Chicago because there were almost no blacks living in those cities at all. Or in Oakland or Detroit or Milwaukee or St. Louis or Baltimore, or Philly, Newark, New York, any of the northern or western urban centers that we think of as having concentrations of African Americans today Almost none of them had any black people living there at all. Between one, three, maybe five percent, a couple of the cities. Over 90 percent of all American blacks still lived in the South under Jim Crow. And those lived mostly in rural areas. The Great Migration, beginning during the First World War, brought millions from the South to the North and West and from the country to the city giving the living conditions and hostile resistance that they faced on the far side of that journey. Uh, I was surprised when I first started researching the Great Migration heavily to learn that the South at the time didn't want them to go. Blacks faced resistance at both ends of the migration. Resistance from leaving and then resistance once they arrived. For all the pervasive racism in the South, blacks were needed as a source of cheap labor. And so those who were preparing or who tried to leave were often running a gauntlet of intimidation, harassment, and violence. Many of them left in the dead of night with you know, little more than the clothes on their backs, and they, they headed out for cities that they'd never seen that were thousands and thousands of miles away. A long distance in any case, but it was a much longer trip a century ago. And they left knowing that they would have a hard life in the northern urban slums, and knowing that violent resistance likely awaited them. But whatever waited for them in the North, they knew it wasn't the South. They knew it wasn't this. On the evening of May 13, 1918, in Valdosta, Georgia, a handful of black farm workers met at the home of Hayes and Mary Turner. The Turners, along with the rest of the group, were laborers in the fields of Hampton Smith, a white farmer. The men were discussing what to do about their employer, who routinely abused his workers and had recently administered a series of escalating beatings to them. 
Hampton Smith frequently manned his labor pool by debt peonage, going to a courthouse and paying the fines of jailed black men who were then required to work for him until the debt was paid. Workers thus compelled could be abused even more readily than a typical black laborer, and Smith had a reputation for being more short-tempered and brutal than most. He had personally delivered several beatings to Mary Turner, a mother of three, until finally the previous year, her husband, Hayes, also an employee, threatened Smith, a crime for which Hayes was sentenced to a stint on a chain gang. The market for black work in this part of rural Georgia belonged to the employers, and so despite everything, Hayes and Mary Turner had no choice but to go back to work for Hampton Smith after Hayes was released. We don't know all the specific details of the evening meetings at the Hayes house. One can easily imagine Mary cooking or tending to the children as the men got drunk and plotted their revenge. What we do know is that three days later, three men with Sidney Johnson as their leader, took a gun from Hampton Smith's house and murdered him with it. Neither Hayes nor Mary Turner were present or involved. Sidney Johnson was the shooter. He had previously been arrested for playing dice and fined $30. When he couldn't pay, he was thrown in jail, and for that price, Hampton Smith bought his servitude from local authorities. During the meeting at the Turners, Johnson still wore the cuts and bruises from a severe beating he'd just received from Smith. His debt had been fully paid, and so when he fell ill one day, he informed Smith that he wouldn't be working. Smith threatened him, and when Johnson insisted that he was too sick to work, Smith delivered the beating. Almost immediately after Johnson shot Smith, a mob was formed to find and kill the culprits. They found their first victim early the next morning. Will Head was one of the men present at the meeting where the plan to kill Hampton Smith had been discussed. The posse planned to hold Will Head prisoner until all the others had been captured so they could be lynched together, but the mob of 300 was hungry and decided to do it that evening. He was beaten, hanged by the neck from an oak tree, and his body was riddled with bullets and left hanging for all to see. And all did see. Hundreds of people from surrounding counties arrived over the weekend to gawk at the bloating, mangled corpse. Shortly after Head had been captured, separate mobs captured Will Thompson and Julius Jones. Thompson was hanged at a church, Jones was hanged at another location, and both bodies were left hanging for all to see. By the next morning, three were dead, but not the killer. Sidney Johnson was proving elusive, and the mob was getting hotter. That morning, Saturday, Hayes Turner was arrested and brought to jail. For his safety, the sheriffs decided to transport him to another location later that day, but they were stopped by 40 masked men, and Hayes Turner was taken away and hanged, and his body was left hanging for all to see. Later in the day, around the time Hayes was being kidnapped and killed, another black man, Eugene Smith, who was completely uninvolved in any of this, was taken by a mob and hanged at the same church as Will Thompson, and alongside Thompson, Smith's body was left hanging for all to see. The mob's sixth and seventh victims were simply random black men, unfortunate enough to find themselves in the wrong place at the wrong time. One was named Chime Riley. He was hanged and then thrown into a river. The other was Simon Schumann, who was lured out of his house by the mob and then simply disappeared. The mob's eighth and ninth victims were slain together. It couldn't be otherwise. Mary Turner was eight months pregnant when they took her. When she'd heard of her husband's murder, she wailed his innocence to the mob and cursed them, swearing she'd see them all arrested and charged. Later, the Associated Press would report that she had made unwise remarks, and the people, in their indignant mood, took exception to her remarks as well as her attitude. The mob seized her and carried her to Folsom's Bridge over the Little River. They tied her ankles together and hung her to a tree head down. Gasoline was pulled from the tanks of a few automobiles and poured over her. Then her clothes were burned off her body. She was still living when a member of the mob produced a knife and opened her belly, spilling her viable eight-month-old infant into the dirt below, where its life was ended underneath the heel of a mob member's boot. Mary Turner was shot and shot and shot hundreds of times, said reports, until her body was shredded into a piece of ragged meat that no longer resembled a human being. 
She was cut down and buried on site in a shallow grave marked by a whiskey bottle with a cigar placed in the neck. Three more victims of the mob were pulled out of the river before Sidney Johnson was located and surrounded in a house. The house was lit up with gunfire and Johnson was killed. The mob stripped his body, then cut off his genitals and threw them into the middle of the street. They tied a rope around the neck of the corpse and the other end to the back of a car, dragging the body around town to a place where it could be put on display for all to see. Finally, a pyre was built and the public watched his body burn down to ash. At least 13 people had been killed. Some reports have it at 18, but 13 is the traditional number. When allegations were made against a few members of the mob, they were brought before a Brooks County grand jury, the foreman of which was William A. Whipple, one of the leaders of the lynching rampage. No one was ever held accountable or even charged for the barbarism of May 1918 in and around Valdosta, Georgia. In 2010, a simple memorial to Mary Turner went up on the road over the bridge where she was lynched, just a sign commemorating her in the event. Soon after it was erected, it was shot up. It could be that someone didn't know what they were doing. It's not uncommon to see bullet holes in random highway signs out in the country, but a few years later, not long ago, as I record this, it was shot up again, shot 13 times, one for, one bullet for each victim of the mob. Or maybe it's a coincidence, who knows. Some 500 black residents of Brooks County, Georgia, fled after that lynching rampage, just as many are fleeing the onslaught of fire bombings and shootings in Southern California today. Some made their way to other parts of Georgia or the South, but Many joined that first wave of the Great Migration to the northern industrial cities that had gotten underway two years earlier. With the outbreak of the First World War in Europe in late 1914, U.S. industry was ramping up to sell materials and supplies into that inferno, so more workers were needed. And they were needed even more after the U.S. joined the war in 1917, when millions of men were called out to military bases or overseas assignments. America's expanding economy and wide-open geography had made for a society historically with a chronic labor shortage, a fact which, despite persistent and often violent resistance by the ownership class, had led to steadily rising wages and improving working conditions for the workers throughout the 19th century. Immigration from Europe had been the traditional means of filling that gap, the, the labor gap since the founding, but with the outbreak of World War I, the flow of humanity across the Atlantic came to a halt right at the time when U.S. industry was blowing up to meet the war's demand. Workers were more valuable than ever, they had more leverage than ever, and they knew it, especially those first and second generation immigrants who had come over to the U.S. steeped in European ideas about socialism and worker solidarity. In 1917, strikes were called across many U.S. cities all at once. Labor leaders knew that this was their moment of maximum leverage, and they were looking to lock in gains that were going to outlast the war. But management had a secret weapon. See, since 1916, Northern Industry had been engaged in a recruiting campaign involving coordinated propaganda, promises, uh, e economic incentives to lure African Americans out of the rural South and into the northern cities to work. Desperate to escape Jim Crow and with limited options in the North once they arrived, many blacks took whatever jobs they could get and weren't in a position to negotiate about wages or working conditions. And so they, in addition to that, they were often locked into employment for a time by whoever paid their way. Well, this was used with great effect to break those strikes of 1917. The strikes of 1917 were a great failure, and, and this is a big reason why. They arrived in thousands and tens of thousands, and then in a great flood into Chicago and New York and other cities of the East and Midwest. And coming from the South and being accustomed to low wages and abuse down there, they were willing to work for relative peanuts in the North, and you know, it was an improvement on that at least but it undercut attempts by the socialists and other labor leaders to organize. The hostility against blacks by immigrant communities that would be later demonstrated in Cicero, the story I just read, it erupted into violence immediately upon the arrival of the first blacks at the outset of the migration. 
In St. Louis in 1917, a four-day riot broke out in which whites hunted down and killed over 100 blacks. Four days. The next month, in 1917 in Houston, black soldiers of the 3rd Battalion, 24th Infantry, remember this is World War I, they went on a premeditated killing rampage. They took out 16 white civilians and law enforcement officers. 110 black soldiers were convicted of taking part. From daily hostility and refusal to work side by side with blacks to brawls and riots in the streets to vandalism and bombings of black residences, the recently arrived European immigrant populations were making it clear in these cities that the America that they had moved to, in their minds, was one that kept its population of Africans safely penned up in the southern part of the country. They did not want to deal with this. And the situation reached a crescendo when the millions of war veterans returned home to find their cities to be very different places than when they left. Many of their neighborhoods were overcrowded and their jobs were being filled by black men who were willing to work for less money. In the summer of 1919, as a young J. Edgar Hoover had visions of a Bolshevik revolution in Washington, D.C., racial violence exploded in three dozen cities across the country, pillaging, fighting, burning, killing, the worst of it in Chicago and Washington, D.C., the two cities where blacks actually made a stand and tried to fight back. In Chicago, 38 people were killed and 15 were killed in D.C., many, many, many more injured in both places, on both sides. The final disaster of the Red Summer, as it became known, took place not in a city. Uh, this is the only incident that didn't take place in a city, but in a lane county of rural Arkansas where five whites and between 100 and 200 blacks were killed in attacks. And so this is what the children and grandchildren of slaves were confronted with when they first ventured out of the land of their ancestral servitude. The Great Migration started up about 50 years after the end of the, the Civil War. They fled lynchings to be met with fire bombings and riots. A generation later, their own children faced the barbarism of Cicero when they attempted to move out of their overcrowded ghetto tenements to better neighborhoods. And today, their children and grandchildren are penned up in burned out, economically unviable inner city craters, all the economic capital long since fled with the white populations who long ago climbed out to the suburbs and pulled up the ladder behind them. Not all black people, of course. Of course, there are many black people who are very successful, but, but, but black people, the black community, has suffered without a break here since the days of slavery. The ideology of bootstrapping and individual responsibility is fine as far as it goes. It's, it's fine for self-help books, and it's the advice I give my friends. But it's worth remembering that Harvey and Janetta Clark, the couple who tried to move to Cicero, they graduated from high school. They graduated from college. They got and stayed married. They did responsible things like work overtime and save their pennies to buy their daughter a piano. In that post-war period when the nation was being reconfigured by the laying down of interstate highways and suburban housing developments, the immigrant populations of the previous hundred years, the Irish, the Poles, Jews, and all the Southern and Eastern Europeans that had come in droves since the middle of the 19th century, they all made their way out of the inner cities and melted into the generalized American mainstream white population. When a college-educated conscientious black family like the Clarks tried to follow them, they got Cicero. And those who hadn't yet made the attempt, they got the message of Cicero. This was the situation of blacks in the North until just a generation ago. In the South, blacks were still living under Jim Crow, and so de jure, not de facto, segregation was in place. By the time the law and culture had changed to the point where an event like Cicero was unlikely to occur, so I think we can all agree it's unlikely to occur uh, in, in, in that way today, although the stories I read from Los Angeles are like a different version of that. By the time law and culture had changed to that point, the wealth gap between the ghetto and the middle class suburb grew so large that it was, it was a wall between the two almost as high as the one provided by the threat of physical violence. 
As a result, despite segregation being the law of the land across the South just a handful of decades ago, today, nine of the 10 most segregated cities in the United States and 16 of the top 20 most segregated cities are all in the North and West. They're not in the South. Cities like New York, Philly, Cleveland, Milwaukee, Los Angeles. And whether America's black citizens are being racially cleansed from Los Angeles or economically eliminated by gentrification and urban renewal, the overall trend of black migration today is out of the northern and western cities where they had tried to make their homes in the 20th century and back to the south where they started. Already by the middle of the 20th century, as Martin Luther King and others were marching against those last fortresses of official segregation in the south, Many African-American intellectuals and activists in the urban north were, they, they were already becoming disillusioned and frustrated and angry because they knew what waited for their people in the south once the marches were over and legal segregation was defeated. It, it was already defeated in the north and things weren't great. They knew that beyond the wall of Jim Crow were another series of barriers and traps infinitely more complicated and durable and less susceptible to sit-ins and marches. It was a paradoxical experience of being a homeless wanderer and yet utterly trapped. It was captured so well by James Baldwin's disaffected rage. Leaving aside all the physical facts which one can quote, leaving aside rape or murder, leaving aside the bloody catalog of oppression, which we are in one way too familiar with already, what this does to the subjugated the most private, the most serious thing this does to the subjugated is to destroy his sense of reality. It destroys, for example, his, uh, his father's authority over him. His father can no longer tell him anything because the past has disappeared and his father has no power in the world. This means, in the case of an American Negro, born in that glittering republic, and in the moment you are born, since you don't know any better, Every stick and stone and every face is white. And since you have not yet seen a mirror, you suppose that you are too. It comes as a great shock around the age of five or six or seven to discover that the flag to which you have pledged allegiance <laughs> along with everybody else has not pledged allegiance to you. It comes as a great shock to discover that Gary Cooper killing off the Indians when you were rooting for Gary Cooper that the Indians were you. It comes as a great shock to discover that the country, which is your birthplace and to which you owe your life and your identity, has not in its whole system of reality evolved any place for you. <laughs> the disaffection, the demoralization, and the gap between one person and another, only on the basis of the color of their skins, begins there and accelerates, accelerates throughout a whole lifetime, so that presently you realize you're 30, and are having a terrible time managing to trust your countrymen. By the time you are 30, you have been through a certain kind of mill, and the most serious effect of the mill you've been through is again not the catalog of disaster, the policeman the taxi drivers, the waiters, the landlady, the landlord, the banks, the insurance companies, the millions of details, 24 hours of every day, which spell out to you that you are a worthless human being. It is not that. It's by that time you've begun to see it happening in your daughter or your son or your niece or your nephew. You are 30 by now and nothing you have done has helped you to escape the trap. But what is worse than that is that nothing you have done, and as far as you can tell, nothing you can do, will save your son or your daughter from meeting the same disaster and not impossibly coming to the same end. See, this sense of being unwanted guests in someone else's house a house you helped build and have lived in ever since it went up. I, I remember somewhere Baldwin mentioned a comment by Bobby Kennedy, where Kennedy had said in the 1960s that, that who knows 
Perhaps in 40 years, there could even be a black president. It was meant to be a hopeful, progressive thing to say, and I suppose it was, in, you know, in its way. But Baldwin said that everyone in Harlem just laughed and shook their heads when they heard that. Because here's Bobby Kennedy, an Irish Catholic whose people only started arriving in the U.S. in the 1850s or so. And already his brother, John F. Kennedy, has been president. And he's telling black people who have been in America since the 1600s that who knows, maybe if you behave yourselves in 40 years, one of you might get a shot. Now, I know what RFK meant, but I also understand why Baldwin shook his head. Now I'm going to shift gears a bit. Um, like I told you in the intro, this is just the prologue to the series. It's a few things that I want in your head. Uh, I want you to be thinking about as we get into the meat of the Jonestown story. It's the backdrop for all that. Some of it's just a few of my thoughts. Some of it's these articles. But right now I'm going to switch gears from what we were just into. So a few years before I made my escape from Los Angeles, I used to live there. Um, I was walking back to my apartment one night after a late dinner when I came across a homeless man lying on the sidewalk around the corner from where I lived. He looked young, but he was in bad shape and laying in the middle of the sidewalk, not off to the side or against a building. It was winter time and it was cold out, and he was there curled up shivering on the sidewalk in a t-shirt with no shoes or socks. The no shoes or socks got my attention, and so when I looked closer I could see that his face was bruised up and his lip was bleeding like he'd been beaten up. So I stopped to see if he needed help, which is a stupid way to put it because of course he needed help. So then I, I uh, stopped to see if there was anything I could do to help. Which is another stupid way of putting it, because he was a beaten man shivering on the street with no shoes or socks. And I lived around the corner in an apartment with an extra bedroom and a closet full of shoes. And for that matter, I was carrying a bag of restaurant leftovers I'd probably spent 40 or 50 bucks on. Anyway, I couldn't get his attention. He was out of it, drunk or stupefied or I don't know what. Maybe he just didn't want to talk to anyone. Um, I thought about calling the police, thinking that maybe they would bring him to a hospital or a shelter, but I had remembered seeing a news story about how L.A. police would scoop up homeless people from nice neighborhoods like mine and dump them off at Skid Row. I don't know if that's true. I, I actually, thinking about it, don't know if I really saw that story, but it was in my mind at the time, so I didn't call the police. Um, instead, I decided to leave my leftovers for him and run around the corner to my house to get him a few things. So I grabbed him some shoes and socks, a uh, sleeping bag that I never used out of my closet, a jacket, a uh, few things out of the fridge, and I jogged back, but he was gone. I left the stuff there on the sidewalk, and when I came back the next morning, a few things had been taken, but the shoes and sleeping bag and most of it was just kicked around and strewn on the sidewalk by whoever had come across it. I was with a date that night, so my selfless heroics didn't lack an audience. Um, even at the time, even at the very moment that I was stopping to check on the guy, I was wondering whether I would have been stopping if she hadn't been there to see it. It bothered me then. It bothers me now when I think back on it. I hope I would have, and I might have. There are times when I'm alone, when I do stop, but there are times when I don't. And when I don't, it's not merely laziness or selfishness of the common sort that causes me to suppress my empathy and keep moving, although it is those things too. But there's something else. This idea or feeling that, that always creeps in and starts pulling at my pant leg, and it's something like, if I'm stopping or digging change out of my pocket, I'm making a gesture toward caring about this person, about, about what happens to him. But if I actually care about what happens to this fellow human being, this neighbor within my own city, then how do I justify giving him the change in my pocket instead of the dollar? Or the dollar instead of the $20 bill, which, if I'm being completely honest, I really can spare. At the very, at the very least, his need for it is greater than mine. And then how do I stop there if I actually care? Given the man's desperate situation, how do I not take him into my home and share my meals with him since I have extra space and extra food? I remember in that same neighborhood, there was another homeless man, uh, an old, 
ruined man with a long, scraggly gray beard. Unlike the first man, this old man was not just passing through, but he was, he was something of a fixture in the neighborhood. Anyone who lived in the neighborhood for the few years that I was there would remember walking past him on the way to one of our local coffee shops, because really, who goes to Starbucks? Or to one of our restaurants with $12 craft cocktails and original local art for sale on the walls. Local art, of course, because that's the kind of people we were and the kind of neighborhood we lived in, you know. It's very important that you know that. Anyway, you couldn't miss this old man if you tried. You, you knew when he was within 50 yards, even around a corner, because his smell was so strong and awful. You rarely saw him walking around. He would shuffle to one spot, and then he would just stand there in his ruined, filthy clothes, staring at people or staring off into space couldn't speak as far as I could ever figure out. The times that I tried to offer him food or when I found him staring at me and asked if he was okay, and I was aware as the words left my mouth that this was also a stupid question, uh, he would just look at me and mumble. Sometimes he would stare at me intensely and seem to be trying to squeeze words out through a mouth that wouldn't cooperate. <laughs> he would just stare at you and make that noise. Sometimes it was obvious that he'd pissed or shit himself. But if he was even aware of it, it seemed to bother the rest of us more than it bothered him. One time, I brought him an old pair of pants that I thought were close to his size and a shirt. Uh, I brought them in a plastic grocery bag. Like an idiot, I spoke to him like a child. I mean, I'm just an idiot. I, I spoke to him like, hey, buddy, how you doing? Uh... I had some clothes I, I don't really wear anymore. I thought you might be able to use them. Just moron. And he just stares at me. And when he stared at you, it, you know, it wasn't dead-eyed. There was in intense desperation in his eyes. Almost like someone was trapped inside. And so I'm there like even even bigger idiot. I bring, like he doesn't respond, so I don't know what to do. And I'm an idiot, so I bring my condescending tone down even a few more notches. Like I'm trying to break through a language barrier or something. And I'm like, these clothes? And I'm pointing to the bag. You want these clothes? And I'm sort of making a gesture of holding them out to him while pointing. You want these clothes? It's just an idiot. But he's staring at me. He's just staring at me. So I don't know what to do. And I just set the bag at his feet and say something also stupid. You know, okay, well... I'll just leave these here, something like that. And when I do that, he very slowly turns his neck down to look at the bag. And then very slowly turns his head back up to look at me. And his eyes now are just boring straight into mine with that intense desperation. And it almost seems like he's about to take a fumbling step in my direction. So I start to move back and I'm waving and I'm saying idiotic things like, all right, well, you take care of yourself. It's just idiot. It's embarrassing, but this is how I was behaving. And when I, so when I, when I came back uh, by the place a little while later, he had moved on and the bag was still sitting on the ground with the clothes in it. He just left without them. And this guy wasn't begging or panhandling. He wasn't doing anything. I never saw him ask for or accept change. I, I never saw him digging through trash. And I saw this guy a lot. I have no idea to this day how or when he ate or if he ever cleaned himself in the years that I lived there. I, his, his, his brain seemed to be fried from drugs or scrambled from mental illness. I, I, I don't know. I mean, there, there was little to mark him off from the animal world except that behind his eyes was an unmistakable fear and suffering that you immediately recognize as human when you see it. You recognize it because you've known it yourself. In moments, in those dark moments where, you know, like, like, like when you're high on a building and you have that errant thought, what if I just jumped? It just flashes through your mind like lightning, irrational. You get a rush of butterflies in your stomach as you recognize the danger and your biology warns you away from the excesses of freedom that you just pushed up against. This old man had the look of somebody who let that feeling get away from him for one or two seconds too long and only has reality rush back in after he's already let go of the railing 
and he's falling 20 stories to the ground, thinking of his life and the people who are never going to understand what just happened to him. A panicked look that was some combination of what have I done and it's too late as he watches the pavement rush up toward him. If there's a hell, this man was in it. And by all appearances, however he'd begun as someone's innocent three-year-old boy, he'd been in it for a long time. And yet, after a while, he sort of faded into the background, like one of the trees or fire hydrants. You know, you'd step around him thoughtlessly, avoiding him with the same unconscious ease as when you notice and step over a dog turd without having to adjust your step. And so I walk by, like everyone else, and here's this old man burning in hell. Some old man with no name. I mean, he'd probably forgotten it, and who knows if there was anyone else left in the entire world who knew it. He had a name when he was someone's three-year-old, but now there's just this old man, covered in filth, caked in filth, who can't speak, stinking up the walk to get my latte. And after a while, it was fine. It was fine. Old man, burning in hell, walked by him every day, and it was fine. You know, I have these daydreams sometimes, where I'm standing in line at the Day of Judgment. You're welcome to take that as a figure of speech, or not, if it suits you. And I'm going over my life and thinking about how I'm going to talk my way out of all the big ticket sins that stick out in my memory, but when it's my turn... It turns out that God doesn't really care about most of that stuff. What he really wants to know is how I could have just walked by that old man for years and done nothing and even stopped being bothered by it. An angel comes up and reveals to me that all the time when he was trying to force words past his rotten teeth, that he was trying to scream, help me. And every time I just walked by, even though I had an extra bedroom and a second bathroom with a shower I never used, half the planet living 10 people to a one-room mud hut, and I let this old man sleep in a gutter blocks from my apartment every night for years. How could I explain that? How could I have had the nerve to sleep comfortably in my bed every night as as if I'd held up my end of being alive for the day? Now, I'm a pretty clever guy, so I can think of plenty of reasons that would get me out of trouble with you if you were asking that question. Get me out of the conversation, at least. But in front of God, after the jig is up, when my reasons are just words and everything is on the table, which is that if I don't shut out the humanity of these people or construct a story to put some distance between myself and what I see every day, not just on the news, but in my own town, in my own neighborhood, I'll be forced to make changes in my life that I don't really feel like making. And that's the reality. We have to be able to tell ourselves some pretty good stories to be able to drive past people sleeping under a bridge on our way to church and still continue to think of ourselves as human beings. It comes down to a choice, my humanity or theirs. And I end up sacrificing theirs in order to continue thinking of myself as a good person. Because a good person couldn't just walk by another human being in that state and do nothing. If I saw someone fall down, not a homeless person, a person in a suit on the way to work. If I saw the person trip and fall, I would help him up and I would ask if he was okay. If he was injured, I'd give him a ride or I'd wait until an ambulance came. Basically, I would do whatever was necessary based on the person's need. And if I didn't, if I just stepped over him like a tree branch had fallen in my path or... If I had stopped to help him up, but seeing that he had broken his leg, decided that it was all just too much trouble, and then I moved on, I would be a bad person. If I saw someone else do that, I would think he was a bad person. But we all walked by that ruined man with no feeling at all. We felt nothing about it every day, carefully stepping around him like someone hadn't cleaned up their dog shit, and we were all still good people. Just ask us. We, the smiling, happy latte sippers, existed within a web of implicit mutual agreements where we do things like help each other up when we fall. This homeless guy, he existed outside of that social web. And so our obligations to each other didn't fully extend to him. 
You know, we can tell the homeless guy, sorry, I don't have any change, even though we do. And even though we don't mind parting with it simply because we don't feel like stopping to dig it out and feel no guilt about that. And then walk into a Starbucks and drop that change into the tip jar and actually feel like we've done something nice for somebody. I know what a lot of people think when I say these things because I've heard it before and because obviously since I'm not quitting my job to work full time at a rescue mission, it's in some sense what I myself think. It's crazy and basically impossible to expect anyone to go through their lives weeping over the suffering of the world and devoting the last drop of what they don't absolutely need to survive to alleviating as much of it as they can. And it is crazy. But there are people out there who do it. There are. They see the beaten man with no shoes or the broken old man in hell, and they're overcome by the abject awfulness of what it means to find yourself in that state and they look around and say, why isn't anyone doing anything about this? And they see the prisons full and children running around rotting cities and old people alone with their bed sores in state hospitals. And they look around and say, why isn't anyone doing anything about this? And they realize finally that it's because nobody really cares. Not really. Because those people are not our people. And if they're no one's people, let them look out to themselves. Life is hard enough as I stroll to get my latte. So this series of podcasts is about a man who decided that those were his people and that he would take their side against the rest of us. Armed with nothing but his message, this man and his followers fed thousands of the hungry. They comforted the forgotten and outcast. They visited the imprisoned and they turned absolutely no one away. Pimps and prostitutes, violent criminals, addicts, the mentally ill and handicapped, no one. And when this man saw shame in the eyes of these people, as is so common, he said it was the world that should be ashamed. And he denounced the world as a house of iniquity and the kingdom of Satan. And he set about to make a place where his lowly and despised children could know peace and know joy. And of course, this man died ignominiously to the sound of mockery and scorn. I don't mean Jesus, of course. You read the episode description. I'm talking about the Reverend Jim Jones, who, despite the signs and wonders he performed, turned out not to be the second person of the Blessed Trinity, but all too human. And for someone merely human, you might think that taking on the suffering of the world might be enough to drive a person crazy, and you would be right about that. But then things didn't end so well for Jesus and his followers either. Even the patience of Christ had its limits. In between multiplying fishes and healing lepers, Jesus was chasing money changers around with whips and denouncing the religious authorities as the enemies of mankind and the spawn of the devil. As a rule, saviors of the world tend not to have a lot of compromise in them. And they can only see a latte drinker like me step over so much suffering before they start looking around for another whip. The story that ended in the Jonestown catastrophe began as a dynamic and promising civil rights movement, cobbled together and driven to its accomplishments by the will and energy of Jim Jones. Most people know Jim Jones and his people's temple through cliches. Don't drink the Kool-Aid, right? And they're remembered today primarily for the movement's cultish features. But neither Jones nor his people thought of themselves first and foremost as a church. At least not by the end. By the end, they considered themselves communist revolutionaries, a vanguard of the radical left that had seized the stage from the traditional socialists and liberals in the late 1960s. And so this series isn't only going to be a biography of Jones and his movement. In fact, there's going to be good stretches, especially in part two, that leave them aside altogether. To understand what happened at Jonestown, we have to take a shot at understanding the social movements into which Jim Jones and his people were plugged and the events that influenced how they saw themselves and their role in the world. The life and death of People's Temple is a story and microcosm of the radical left itself over the years uh, leading up to the uprisings of 1968 and in their sordid and desperate aftermath bleeding into the 70s. In some ways, Jim Jones and his People's Temple come to have more to do with 
the Bader-Meinhof gang and the Symbionese Liberation Army than they do with David Koresh or Heaven's Gate. Jim Jones and his people walked the path of radicalization that was followed by many of their fellow travelers, the path that led from black civil rights to black power, from integration to separatism, from reform to revolution. Jeff Gwynn, a biographer of Jim Jones and his movement, he said that if Jones had died, uh, say, in a car accident sometime in the late 1960s or early 70s, he would be remembered to this day as one of the early pioneers of the civil rights movement in the 1950s. And, and there's no question that he's right about that. If he had died then, he would be remembered for starting the first racially integrated church in the state of Indiana and for the work that he and his people did integrating movie theaters and restaurants uh, and for the thousands of black people in California that they helped to escape drugs and they mentored out of prison uh, and that they provided free meals and health care and education to. If Jim Jones had died in the late 1960s, this is how he would be remembered. But that's not what happened. Instead, he died in 1978 from a gunshot to the head deep in the jungle of South America after his followers murdered a U.S. congressman and over 900 of his people, most of them elderly and children, most of them women, the vast majority of them poor and black, pulled out of the ghettos and orphanages of the San Francisco Bay Area in Los Angeles, lay dead on the jungle floor at his command. There's a moment in the Jonestown story that I can't clear out of my head. And, and, and I'll wrap up this prologue here shortly. I've been reading and thinking so much about Jones and his people for so long and about what happened that I even dreamed about this moment once a few months back. So Jones is sitting there on his throne, overlooking the big open-sided pavilion there in Jonestown, around which the cottages and schools and storehouses were built, and beyond that, the fields of cabbage and taro and other produce that supported the settlement, and beyond that, the impenetrable jungle. Countless miles of jungle. Occasional visitors from the Guyanese capital, Georgetown, would have to take a small aircraft to a landing strip near Port Kaituma. That was, the, the landing strip was nothing more than a rectangle of dirt carved out of the trees and flattened. And then from there, they would be towed in a trailer behind a tractor down a jungle path to the People's Temple Agricultural Project, Jonestown. But most arrivals to Jonestown didn't get there by air. The settlers arriving from the United States to make their home there permanently, they went through a very different rite of passage before arriving at the place where they'd spend the rest of their lives. They flew from the United States to Georgetown, carrying nothing more than their clothes and a few personal items, maybe a few heirlooms or trinkets or a few photos, although jewelry and other valuables would be confiscated as signs of bourgeois elitism as soon as they arrived and Having photos of family were liable to bring you under suspicion of split loyalties, so, so it was frowned upon. When they arrived in Georgetown, they boarded a boat owned by People's Temple, and they hunkered down for a bumpy 24-hour-long ocean voyage along the coast to the mouth of the Kaituma River, and then up the river into the heart of the jungle for another seven hours. The majority of Jonestown residents, again, mostly poor and mostly black, mostly elderly and children, plucked out of L.A. and Bay Area ghettos, had never been on a boat or a plane, period, let alone been out of the United States or to another continent. So Jim Jones is, back to my vision, he's sitting on his throne in the central pavilion, the place where his people would gather every night, almost a thousand people out there surrounded by the dark jungle. You know, if you were to fly over it in a plane or a helicopter, you'd see this, this clearing in the jungle lit up by generators a thousand people gathered in this pavilion, yelling and chanting or dancing and singing, just depending on the mood. And they, they would gather there in this place each night to eat, share meals, sing, discuss community issues, and to threaten the many enemies plotting to destroy them from within and without. So Jones is sitting there, and it's silent, except for the jungle's evening sounds and the Jonestown chickens, maybe a few barking dogs. And I imagine in my dream of this scene that Jim Jones felt the silence as a relief. Because for the last few hours, the thick, steamy, jungle air had been choked with the cries of suffocating children. 
and the resigned moaning of their parents, and the sound of husbands comforting wives through frothing mouths and bodies pulling up the grass as they jerked and kicked from cyanide seizures. Jones is looking out over the scene. Nine hundred bodies on the ground, fanned out from what had been the center of their lives. Jim Jones in his seat with the sign hanging over it which read, Those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Jim Jones, near the end, was losing control of himself and also over his people. They couldn't avoid noticing that their energetic and charismatic leader now so often succumbed to irritable lethargy and violent mood swings. On the final evening, despondent and exhausted, Jones used the last of his power to drag his people with him to suicide, badgering and cajoling them with a barbiturate, slurred speech, a condition which his people had become accustomed to seeing him recently. As old folks lined up for death and parents set about murdering their hundreds of children, Marceline Jones, the wife of Reverend Jim, tried to stop it. She argued and tried to derail the ongoing death process as her husband begged her to have the dignity to die with her child. with a degree of dignity. Lay down your life with dignity. Don't lay down with tears and agony. It's nothing to death. It's like Max said. It's just stepping over into another plane. Don't, don't be this way. Stop this hysteric. This is not the way for people who are socialist to communists to die. No way for us to die. We must die with some dignity. Soon we'll have no choice. Now we have some choice. You think they're going to still allow this to be done and allow us to get by with this? It must be insane. But children, it's just something to put you to rest. Oh, God. Mother, 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 please. Mother, please, 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 don't, don't do this, don't do this. Stay down your life with your child, but don't do this. And the story told by a few survivors is that she wouldn't give up, and so Jim, her husband, ordered her restrained. Several henchmen came forward and seized her, which was shocking to the people, because Marceline, they all called her mother, she was a revered figure in her own right, and so one young man, Poncho Johnson, rushes in and fights the others off of her. And at that moment, Jim Jones shouts, What the hell do you think you're doing? Whereupon, Poncho turns squarely to face Jim Jones and stands at attention. And Jim says, You take that poison right now. And without skipping a beat or saying a word, Poncho walks up, and drinks his share of the cyanide and falls to the ground moments later as Marceline watches him die. Anyway, in my dream, the scene in my dream, this stuff's all over. And it's only Jim sitting there in his chair, surrounded by death and quiet. Marceline is dead too. She drank the cyanide laced flavor aid with everyone else, and now her body was crumpled up on the floor near where Jim Jones is sitting. We don't know what her final moments were like, whether her husband held her as her nervous system began to shut down, whether he apologized for the way everything had turned out, or tried to assure her that their act of revolutionary suicide would reverberate and cause the change that their living movement had failed to bring about, or whether in her abject horror at the sight of so many mothers using droppers to squirt poison down their infants' throats, 
if this suddenly caused the scales to fall from her eyes, and as she looked around at the carnage conducted by her husband, she reflected on the role she'd played in it all, and, 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 and the signs she'd ignored, and the doubt she'd suppressed, and the excuses she'd made, even to the end when she knew better than anyone else that her husband had gone insane. Maybe the dam holding back everything she denied and rationalized broke as she watched everyone she knew twisting and writhing on the ground, and their moaning and weeping called out to her like the voices of demons coming to collect her soul, and she turned away from her husband and died hating him. We don't know. It's often only in retrospect that we recognize that a long series of compromises and bad choices as many individual opportunities to make different decisions and go another way. Sometimes it, it doesn't feel that way. Sometimes we make only one choice, and that one choice frames all the decisions we make after that until we, we find ourselves enmeshed in a web that would take rare vision and courage to even see out of, let alone escape. You know, maybe a young... 17, 18 year old German in 1939 makes one choice that if you're going to have a well ordered society that doesn't collapse into anarchy, then mere individuals like him must accept and carry out the duties assigned to them by the state. One choice, one decision. Now, there might be things he dislikes or disagrees with, but if everyone goes around substituting their individual preferences for state policy, you'd have chaos. So, of course, he accepts his draft summons. And once in the army, he heads to Poland where the generals send him. And once in Poland, he's assigned to guard a gate at a prison camp, and you see where this is going. And throughout history, men have died for what were later revealed to be meaningless or even evil causes, and done so in the name of principles like duty, brotherhood, and justice. Marceline Jones, in fact, most of the people at Jonestown, on November 18, 1978, died for loyalty. She was a Christian girl born in small-town Indiana in the late 1920s, and in her world, a wife was faithful and loyal to her husband in health and sickness, even the sickness unto death. Jim Jones and his People's Temple were different things to different people. They all had their own reasons to justify their apathy or complicity as Jim and the movement ran off the rails. The majority of temple leadership were college-educated white radicals who came into the movement after 1968 and were committed to using it as a, ve as a vehicle to fight one front of the world revolution. That's what they thought they were doing. The lay congregation was almost entirely black, and most of them joined the church to improve their lives or to get their kids off the street and into a better environment reasons like that. Some of them believed in God. Some of them believed Jim Jones was God. Most claimed to be atheists, as required by the Marxist-Leninist faith that they all proclaimed as their true religion. But they all went to their deaths in the jungle, almost all of them voluntarily, if despairingly. Inspired by the title of a book written by Black Panther's founder, Huey Newton, they called their deaths an act of revolutionary suicide in protest against the conditions of an inhumane world. And they chose to die together rather than submit to the American world of fascism and capitalist sin. Now, it's going to take some doing to get to the bottom of something like this, or, or at least get us to a point where we feel like the effort has been worthwhile. I've designed this series to be quite a bit different than the format you're used to from the Israel-Palestine series or from other podcasts like Hardcore History and History on Fire where we have a few episodes of a few hours each that tell a story of something that happened. There's just there's too much to cover here that doesn't fit neatly into the linear narrative of Jim Jones and People's Temple, but which we've got to dive into if we're going to get a feel for this thing. And so instead of doing just a few long episodes released several months apart from one another, I've got a bunch more episodes. Some of them are long, a few hours long, and, and are going to relate the facts and push us through the story that ends in Jonestown. But many of them are shorter and deal with stories and topics that are tangential, but which are going to shed light on what happened in Jonestown. We'll need to talk about the varieties of religious experience in America in the 20th century. I've got a lot of content on the development of the radical left and the black power movement in the 60s and 70s. That's a huge part of the Jonestown story. 
We're going to need to talk about the major figures of those movements, about the FBI and COINTELPRO, about the explosion of violence after 1968 from groups like Weathermen and the Black Liberation Army and the Symbionese Liberation Army. We're going to tell the story of all those groups and several others. We're going to tell the rise and fall of the Black Panthers and what the FBI had to do with that. I've got, I've got an episode on how the twisted logic of radicalism in the 1970s ended up driving German leftists to target Jews for murder in the name of anti-Nazism. We're even going to talk about Charles Manson. And all of it has something to do with Jim Jones and People's Temple. So strap in, because I'm going to be dropping episodes every few weeks until we get our arms around this thing. I'm excited. Next few months are going to be fun. One, two, three. One, two, three. <laughs> There's no place that's softer than